and what's involved. We have with us Mike McGowan from the University of Queensland School of Veterinary Science at Gatton. To give you some background on Michael, he grew up on a wheat fat lamb cattle property near Tamworth and completed his undergraduate veterinary training at the University of Sydney. After several years in, of rural practice, he completed an internship in food, animals, medicine and surgery at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine in Canada. He then completed his PhD conducting a series of studies on the impact of pestivirus infection on the re reproductive performance of cattle. In 1998, Michael was appointed lecturer of animal production at the University of Queensland Faculty of Veterinary Science where he continues his career currently as professor of livestock medicine. Michael's areas of experience in reproductive veterinary medicine are very diverse and very comprehensive. Uh, um, Michael, it's great to have you along and without any further delay, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Greg. If you could bring up your presentation. Yes, brought it up. Could everyone see that presentation? Not at this stage. Mm, I see it, Greg. Hmm. I don't see it at my end. Okay. Will I try again? Mm, yeah, bring it up again, Mike, if you can. Sorry about this, ladies and gentlemen. Just a technical issue. Yep, John, you can see that? Me. And okay, I can't, can't see it at all. Yep, the attendees are seeing it, so yeah, Michael, yeah, cool. go. go. Go ahead. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, it's uh, great to be able to speak with you today, and thank you very much, Greg, for your introduction. Um, this is my debut webinar. So we better get cracking because I'm known for being able to talk a bit on my uh, favourite subjects. It's my great privilege today uh, to be speaking to you on behalf of a remarkable group of people. Firstly, the Cash, cash Cow Research Team and then the Cash Cow Commercial Beef Cattle Producers and Cattle Veterinarians whose incredible commitment and cooperation enabled us to complete the Cash Cow project um, and thus enable me to share with you today the findings. Um, as you can see from the list of organisations um, around the photos, um, there was involvement from a large number of research institutions, government departments, private uh, providers and uh, also there was a connection with the beef CRC and I'd like to acknowledge all of those. In particular I'd like to acknowledge the Meat Livestock Australia uh, for providing the operating funding for this very large project. When we commenced planning the Cash Cow project, we sought answers to two fundamental questions. Why do some cows become pregnant quickly after calving, whilst others take significantly longer or fail to become pregnant? We're also in particular interested in why do some pregnant cows successfully wean their calf, whilst others fail to do so. However, during the course of the project, we developed a more holistic approach focused on answering what we consider is the, uh, one of the fundamental questions that beef cattle producers need to ask and, and that is how is my breeding herd performing in relation to what is practically achievable in this environment? And what I plan to do today is walk you through a process that I believe uh, all commercial beef cattle producers can incorporate into their beef breeding business. 
one of the the important um, outcomes from the cash cow project was the development of a spreadsheet to enable beef cattle producers to determine key performance indicators for their beef breeding business. In particular, key performance indicators such as cost of production, operating margin. And what is important is that the data required um, to generate these key performance indicators can be readily obtained from data uh, gathered on most uh, beef cattle properties. This is a spreadsheet um, that was developed by Jeff Fordyce and Phil Holmes uh, and Tom Newsom. Um, and it is uh, a spreadsheet that is now being progressively made available to the industry. So this spreadsheet enables the producer uh, to answer the question, how is my beef breeding business going? Now, one of the important issues that we uh, recognised during the cash cow project was that there was a critical need to develop measures of beef production. If I use a dairy example, dairy farmers can readily tell you how much milk they're producing. And that's their primary measure of production from a dairy herd. However, um, if you ask beef cattle uh, producers, how much beef are you producing from your breeding herd or how, how, how productive is my breeding herd, they often will uh, say to you, uh, this is what my uh, pregnancy rate is, this is the branding rate or this is the weaning rate. But at the end of the day, the reality is we're, we're paid for kilos of beef produced. So we set about developing uh, a series of measures that define uh, beef production from beef breeding herds. And, we, and I'll walk you through uh, one of the measures that we have developed. The simple approach is if I retain after the annual pregnancy test muster 500 cows, uh, then how much beef can I potentially sell 12 months later? And we would recommend that the, the key measure that producers need to uh, measure is annual live weight production. And what is that? It's the annual change in total weight of cows adjusted for mortality plus kilos of beef weaned. So let's have a look at weaner production as one of the measures of beef production from a uh, beef breeding herd. It's an easy to measure uh, uh, and it provides a good estimate of annual live weight production. All you need to do is at each weaning round record the number of calves. You also need to weigh a representative sample of these weaners to record an average weaner weight. And so at the end, we have annual total number of calves weaned multiplied by the average weaner weight divided by the number of females retained the previous year. Now, this is what we calculated for the cash cow properties enrolled um, in the project. And you can see here that we have data for the four cash cow country types, the southern forest, which is primarily southern Queensland, central forest, primarily central Queensland, northern downs, which is the treeless uh, plains in the Barclay Tableland, but also extending down um, into the Channel area, and the northern forest, which is the forested country extending from the peninsula across the Gulf, across the top end into the Kimberleys and the, uh, the Pilbara. And what we have here um, is what we call a box and whisker plot. And I need to just tell you what these 
lines represent. So let's look at the first line here. This line here is the 50th percentile. So this represents um, what the, if we arranged um, wiener production for the southern forest from lowest to highest, then the 50th percent, the middle um, uh, level of production is here. This line here is the 25th percentile and this line here is the 75th percentile. So <clears throat> the 50th percentile in some ways is quite similar to what you would recognise as the average. All right? Um, and what you can see is that there is considerable variation across the country types. So if we look at the southern forest, we've got wiener production, um, uh, 50th percentile wiener production of about 180 kgs. Whereas when we come down to the northern forest, you can see that it is of the order of about 90 kgs. So immediately you can see the that if we measure wiener production and record it against country type, we can generate benchmarks according to country type. This performance here, the 75th percentile, we believe that this represents what is commercially achievable. So you can see here what is commercially achievable in the southern forest is around 240 kgs, whereas in the northern forest it's only of the order of about 110 kgs. So cash cow has generated benchmarks for beef production according to country types. And this is what we can do. So this is beef production NAPLAN style. So each of these dots re represent the wiener production for individual properties over time in the northern forest. And thus, by plotting these using the box and whisker that I showed you before, you can see, um, for example, this herd here is in this particular year produced well below the 25th percentile, made it to the 25th percentile here. This herd here, um, in one year, nearly the 50th percentile, and the following year, um, well above that. And so to get a true indication, we need to measure performance over multiple years. Typically, we need at least three to five years of data to come up with an accurate measure. <coughs> Pardon me. The, the other very interesting finding from the Cash Cow Project is that we asked producers to tell us what was their estimate of average annual steer growth um, for the pasture country where they ran their breeders. And we plotted that. So we here on the x-axis we have reported average annual steer growth and up here we have average wiener production. And what you can see is there is quite a reasonable relationship between what producers reported as the steer growth, annual steer growth, and wiener production. So what this suggests is that <coughs> the, the beef production that producers expect from their steers should be similar to the beef production they obtain from their breeding herds where the cattle are run on the same country. It also suggests that we may be able to calibrate our breeding country by running a representative sample of steers in that country and measuring their annual growth. So we've now looked at how you might go about measuring beef production from your breeding herd. The next step, um, and this was the primary focus of the Cash Cow Project, was to measure the reproductive performance um, of commercial breeding herds across the major breeding regions of northern Australia. And so you can see each of these dots are the enrolled cash cow properties. 
there were some 72 properties and 142 breeding mobs enrolled. And in total, 78,000 uh, heifers and cows were monitored over a three to four year period. Now, we've colour coded these so that you can see the different uh, country types, where they're located. So the yellow dots are the northern forests. The red dots are what we classified as the northern downs country. The blue are classified as the central forest. And the green is the southern forest. To give you a better feel, I've got up here some representative photographs from those four country types. But most importantly, I've listed here what producers estimated as the average annual steer growth of steers. So for the northern forest, the annual steer growth um, of the cash cow properties in that area was 100 kgs per annum. For the central forest, 180 kgs. Northern downs, 170 kgs per annum and the southern forest uh, cash cow properties, 200 kgs per annum. So that should help you in thinking about, okay, where would I place my property or properties um, in respect to the cash cow um, classification of country type? Now, just to give you an overview of the data that we collected, uh, during the, the cash cow project, um, what the, 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 a critical thing that we did was we conducted a comprehensive survey of the property, uh, the resource, uh, the property management, uh, um, breeding herd management, bull management. And this was reviewed on an annual basis to detect any evidence of change to define <coughs> the, uh, the quality of nutrition during the, uh, during the project. The, one of the primary methods we used was collection of faecal samples for NRS testing to, de to determine dry matter digestibility and crude protein. And also we used the samples to using wet chemistry techniques to estimate the phosphorus concentration. And we collected the faecal samples um, uh, over five uh, strategic times. So January, March, May, August and November were the primary times when we collected faecal samples uh, on properties to determine pasture quality. The cattle uh, were mustered as per normal, um, and we, we we saw the cattle twice a year uh, at the annual preg test muster, typically in continuously mated herds that was at the second round uh, muster, and then the uh, the first annual branding round or the first annual weaning round in continuously mated herds. Um, in year one and year three, we also collected blood samples from a representative sample of cattle in each, uh, in each breeding mob to investigate uh, the impact of infectious diseases. We also collected vaginal mucus samples to investigate the impact of venereal diseases. So let's move on and talk about, in particular, the data that we captured on each enrolled uh, breeding female. And what we used was uh, a crush side electronic data capture system. And using that system, uh, we were able to, to collect uh, between 12 to 20 pieces of data um, on every enrolled heifer and cow. Um, one of the very early um, issues that we needed to address was whether this data collection 
could be done without adversely affecting the normal processing on uh, commercial properties. And I refer you to the uh, histogram here, and this is number of um, mobs, and this is the number of cows processed per hour. And as you can see, we were able to achieve processing rates of between 60 to 100 per hour, capturing 12 to 20 pieces of data. Um, so this um, demonstrates that we can collect a comprehensive set of data on these breeding females. In particular, we capture data such as body condition score, um, uh, year brand, um, other confirmation, um, whether they were lactating or not, and or obviously their pregnancy status, whether they, uh, if they were pregnant, then uh, the estimated fetal age. Now, <clears throat> if I was to ask you how you would go about measuring the reproductive performance of your herd, um, many of you would say we, uh, we would determine reproductive performance by uh, pregnancy rate, uh, weaning rate, branding rate. Uh, the problem with those um, uh, measures is that you, you need to very carefully consider the denominator um, to ensure that the measure is actually telling you something useful. Um, so what we did in the cash cow project was that we developed uh, essentially four new measures to define the reproductive performance of uh, commercial breeding herds. And we used, in particular, fetal ageing to define the month of calving and the month of reconception. So here I have it schematically. So um, uh, this is the an annual production cycle. So from one uh, annual preg test to the next annual preg test. So at this uh, annual preg test, using fetal ageing, we could estimate when cows were due to calve. From this annual preg test, we could back predict when that uh, female reconceived after calving. And from this branding weaning muster, we could determine whether the female successfully reared um, the uh, pregnancy or not. So the key measures that we re would recommend producers use and the key measures that were used in the cash cow project were firstly um, the percentage of lactating cows pregnant within four months of calving. This is our primary measure of reproductive efficiency. And what it tells us is it provides us with a measure of the proportion of cows likely to wean a calf in consecutive years. All right? Um, and <clears throat> it, it certainly includes those cows that achieve an intercalving interval of 12 months. But what we recognise is that practically, and this is due to the the biology of the animal, um, that we're really talking about animals that are achieving intercarving intervals of uh, 11 to 13 months. So that's why we use the term percentage of lactating cows are pregnant within four months of calving, because that tells us what proportion of cows are likely to wean a calf in consecutive years, and that's a very key measure. We, me we measured annual pregnancy rate, and Critically, we determine the percentage of pregnant females which failed to rear a calf and thus experienced either fetal loss or calf loss. We also estimated the incidence of missingness um, of cows, which was our estimate of cow mortality. So let's have a look at some data on the performance of the cash cow uh, mobs. And here I have it organised according to country type. And here are our measures of performance listed here. This figure here 
is the median, the 50th percentile. This figure here is the 25th percentile. And the figures in red are what we consider is what is commercially achievable. In the case of pregnant within four months, annual pregnancy rate, it's the 75th percentile for fetal calf uh, loss, percentage fetal calf loss, it's the 25th percentile. So <clears throat> if we look at pregnant within four months of calving, what you can clearly see is there is considerable variation across country type. If we look at the southern forest, where the, the median is 74%, the northern forest, it's 17%. So what this is saying is that we we need to seriously consider the you know what what the country is capable of doing. It is simply um, if you're in the northern forest, it simply uh, doesn't make sense to be uh, saying to producers, well, you should be achieving a percent pregnant within four months of calving of um, 70 or 80 percent because these these data from commercial uh, commercially managed herds clearly tells us that what is commercially achievable is something in the order of 31 percent so what this uh, table provides you with is for the first time in northern Australia we have a set of benchmarks um, defining what is commercially achievable across broad country types. Now, we should have a few questions on what I've presented so far. Over to you, Greg. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, yes, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, in relation to the spreadsheet that you showed earlier, uh, yes. is, it available, is it available to producers and where can they access it from? Okay, yes, it is available to producers um, and uh, Jeff Fordyce has been providing it to, uh, to producers on request. And what I, uh, what I think we should do at the, um, uh, after the webinar is completed is uh, organise with uh, Jeff for a message to be uploaded uh, providing producers with um, the details they require. It's important for producers to recognise that the, uh, the spreadsheet uh, still requires um, some further tweaking in to improve its user friendliness, but we are keen for uh, producers to trial it uh, because we, we firmly believe it provides some incredibly useful uh, indicators of how their beef breeding business is performing. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, another quick question. Uh, a lot of the data that you've shown has been taken over a series of record high seasons, so the annual live weight gains estimated are higher than the averages from other trial work, particularly for the Downs country. This may be a bit misleading and could give people a higher, a high false expectations. You got any comments on that? Yes. Look, we we recognise um, that uh, the data uh, was collected over a period where, certainly for some properties, there was above average rainfall. I think it's important for people to recognise that the study was conducted between 2008 uh, and 2011, and, and certainly many would remember that 2009 was a particularly uh, poor year. Um, so there was uh, certainly considerable variation in annual rainfall. Um, and what I think is more important is for producers to recognise the process that we uh, used during the cash cow project and look at how they could quite readily do the same on their property. So um, what I would be recommending uh, for people, uh, for example, in the Northern Downs area would be to do what I uh, suggested, that is, 
um, in the paddocks where they're they're running their breeders uh, run on you know over a period of three or four years a rep representative sample of uh, yielding cattle and measure their annual growth. That would enable them to calibrate um, those those breeding paddocks. That's th that's the key. Um, what we've reported on is what we actually found for those properties um, uh, that were located in the northern uh, northern Downs area. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, just a quick uh, message uh, with regard to that spreadsheet. We can always post it on the Future Beef website along with this webinar if that's going to be uh, suitable and any help to everyone. Uh, another quick question: How did you determine commercially viable? Ah, I, I think it's important to understand that we th that was not what we were measuring. We weren't determining whether uh, these properties were commercially viable. Uh, we we are, what we are saying is. Um, that the uh, the performance at the 75th percentile provides an indication of what is commercially achievable. So that's that's quite uh, that's quite different to saying what is uh, w whether the property was commercially viable. So that's why we emphasise that the um, and and at the end I'll uh, summarise the approach. But the first approach is to get a good indication of what what are your costs of production, what it, what what um, what is your operating margin, you know, how profitable is your business? That's the first question to ask, and then you start to look at utilising the cash cow benchmarks. Um, whether there is an opportunity, potential opportunity to improve that by increasing beef production, and you look at your beef production, and then you know you you then look at well, is my beef production um, where I want it to be? And if it's not, then you start to look at reproductive performance. Okay. Uh, we do have other questions coming in, Mike, but I think I'm conscious of time. We might just continue with your presentation, if that's okay. Okay. So, what we've been talking about up to this stage is how the Cash Cow Project went about, uh, firstly, measuring how a beef breeding business is uh, performing, and how you would go about defining beef production from a beef breeding business and reproductive performance of the herds contributing to that uh, to that business. One of the key uh, objectives of the Cash Cow Project was to determine what are the major factors affecting reproductive performance. Now, um, you, many of you will have in your own mind uh, a list that you think is important. And in fact, what we did in the Cash Cow Project was investigate the effect of some 80-odd different factors, uh, nutritional factors, management factors, infectious disease factors, um, and obviously cattle factors. And what I want to report to you now is what we from the detailed analysis that we conducted, what are the half dozen big factors that you need to first consider if you're wanting to change the reproductive performance of your herd? So firstly, let's look at what were the major factors affecting the percentage of lactating cows pregnant within four months of calving in the enrolled cash cow um, herds? And the first important factor was country type. So what's important when I talk about each of these factors is that what I'm talking about is 
the impact of this factor alone, having taken into account all these other factors that I'm going to talk to you about. All right? So on average, when all other factors were taken into account, percent pregnant within four months of calving in the, for in the southern forest was 12% higher than the central forest, 23% higher than in the northern downs, and 59% higher than in the northern forest. So clearly, country type is having a big impact on percent pregnant within four months of calving. Parity. Not surprising, uh, first lactation cows, um, percent pregnant within four, four months of calving, 13 to 16% lower than performance of mature and aged cows. I should highlight to you that what we're talking about here is 13 percentage points lower. So for example, if the percent pregnant within uh, four months of calving for mature cows was 60%, then the percent pregnant within four months of calving for first lactation cows would be 44%. What this finding supports is the uh, recommendation that replacement heifers should be segregated until they wean their first calf. That enables them to be preferentially managed, um, supplemented, etc. Average wet season, and these were based on samples collected for NRS testing between November and April. So average wet season crude protein to dry matter digestibility ratio, um, where that ratio was low, less than 0.125, performance was 7.5 percentage points lower. So what this indicates is the potential response to best practice grazing ma management such as wet season spelling. So where crude protein um, during the wet season is limiting, um, then that's going to adversely affect percent of cows, of lactating cows pregnant within four months of calving. Cows which gain condition between the preg test muster the previous year and the uh, first annual uh, weaning round or branding round the following year, um, their percent pregnant within four months of calving was eight percentage points higher than those that lost condition. So again, it in indicates the critical importance of nutritional management between uh, pregnancy diagnosis through uh, to branding weaning the following year. I now want to um, go into a little more detail with a few uh, what we consider is very important factors um, affecting percent pregnant within four months of calving. And the first one I want to talk to you about is the period of calving. So here we have period of calving during the last production cycle, and here we have percent pregnant within four months of calving. And as you can see, the <coughs> The average percent pregnant within four months of calving for cows that calved in July, September was 49 percentage points lower than that for females which calved during December, January. And as you can see, all right, as the period of calving advances, the likelihood of cows, of lactating cows being pregnant within four months of calving increases. So what it suggests quite strongly is that there is an optimum calving period. And this is something that we need to consider when we're determining, <clears throat> for example, um, when bulls should be put out with females in control mated herds or how we might be able to increase the proportion calving in this time, in this window, uh, by various weaning uh, strategies. Not surprisingly, we were able to demonstrate the body condition score uh, of the uh, pregnant female had a big impact on the likelihood of females being back in calf within four months of calving. 
but it's important to recognise that uh, we were measuring body condition score at the time of pregnancy diagnosis. Uh, the, uh, and that was typically around about four to five months before those cows were due to carb. So what it's indicating is that the, even um, uh, though there was quite a, a delay um, in the uh, time to carving, we're still able to predict um, uh, a significant impact. So cows that were in poor body condition at the time of the preg test had a percent pregnant within four months of carving, 18 percentage points lower than cows that were in good body condition. And, in, and I think what's important here to recognise is that quite clearly um, uh, we, we're often conducting our pregnancy diagnosis muster um, in the early to mid dry and, and obviously if cows are in poor body condition then it's very unlikely they're going to be able to gain body condition and hence you know, the whole issue of managing body condition um, requires a much long, longer term um, approach, in particular focusing on uh, weaning management in particular. I want to show you here um, the effect of the average wet season cow phosphorus status. And the, the way in which we define the phosphorus status was based on the, uh, the fecal phosphorus to estimated metabolizable energy. Um, and we used a threshold of less than or equal to 500 um, as being indicative of a high risk of phosphorus deficiency affecting performance, whereas where the uh, fecal P to ME was greater than 500, we considered that a lower risk of P deficiency affecting performance. Now, let's look at the green line here, uh, and this is percent pregnant within four months. And as you can see, um, particularly for first lactation cows, where there was a high risk of P deficiency affecting performance, there the percent pregnant within four months of calving was 24 percentage points lower than where the risk of P deficiency affecting performance was low. Um, there wasn't a great deal of difference here in our second lactation cows and our mature cows, but there was a difference here in the aged cows. What this is demonstrating is that um, there are particular uh, groups of animals in our breeding herds that are, uh, are most at risk of phosphorus deficiency affecting performance. And the group most at risk is our first lactation cows. Why is that? Well, they're still growing. They're, they're, they're having to put phosphorus into the developing fetal um, uh, skeleton, and then they're going to be losing phosphorus in their first lactation. So as far as phosphorus is, con is concerned, they're conflicted. They're trying to put phosphorus into their own bones, and they're losing it into the fetus and in by the milk. Um, it's also important to recognise that phosphorus deficiency is not just a problem of the areas across nor, um, far northern Australia. We encountered evidence of phosphorus deficiency in the southern forest and central forest. So if we use a threshold of less than 420 um, milligrams of uh, fecal P uh, to um, megajoule of ME as the threshold, and this is the, the threshold recommended in the most recent phosphorus manual, we found that uh, in the southern forest and central forest, average wet, about a quarter of average wet season uh, FP to MEs were low. So not just a problem of the northern downs and northern forests where we found over two-thirds of those in the low category. We might have a few questions on on, on the factors that we identified as having a big impact on percent pregnant within four months, Greg? Yep, without a doubt.
Okay. Uh, did you discover any relationship between reproductive performance and stocking rates? Okay. Stocking rate, um, as all of you would appreciate, can be quite a challenging measure. Um, we certainly attempted to record stocking rate, um, but because of the uh, regular movements of cattle in and out of paddocks, we could only come up with um, broad estimates of, of stocking rate. Um, so <clears throat> per se, we didn't uh, identify stocking rate as a major factor, but quite clearly we identified other measures of uh, nutrition as having big, big impacts, such as body condition score um, at the preg test muster, um, such as change in body condition score, such as uh, the ratio of crude protein to dry matter digestibility. All of those can be impacted by stocking rate. So you have to, th um, in these complex models, um, we've identified one major factor and then you can take that one major factor aside and look at what contributes to cows being in satisfactory body condition score at the preg test. And most definitely, stocking rate is going to play an important role there. Mm -hmm. Another quick question. Is the body condition score recommendation still at time of calving or are you suggesting a body condition score at pregnancy diagnosis? All the, all the uh, research that has been conducted and primarily conducted uh, in, in a research situation where uh, cattle were regularly observed and body condition score at calving could be recorded, that has confirmed the critical importance of body condition score at calving uh, with respect to its impact on the interval between calving and resumption of cycling. What we were able to demonstrate is that in fact um, body condition score at the time of pregnancy diagnosis is, is, is also related to percent pregnant within four months of calving. Um, and the issue is that that was when we were able to record for all cows enrolled in the study their body condition score. Um, what I think is uh, really important is for people to understand that um, uh, one, one body condition uh, score is about 45 kgs. And so you have to think about, well, if cows are in poor body condition or less than uh, required body condition, how long is it going to take me and what am I going to have to do to increase one body condition? And so really people need to be looking at body condition score of, cow, of, of lactating cows to determine when weaning should be done. Weaning should be done on the basis of cow body condition. And that then will flow through to ensuring cows calve in good body condition. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm conscious of time. Uh, we do have a lot of questions <laughs> coming in, but I think um, in relation to time, if we could continue with your presentation, that'd be great. Thank you very much, Greg. I will. J j just to draw to your attention, um, these photos that I've been utilising for our question time, they're photos demonstrating the uh, electronic data capture under different conditions. And so this is on a, um, uh, a property up on the Northern Downs. Um, and what I think is important is for people to appreciate that we were able to um, quite readily measure performance of cattle under quite varying conditions. Okay, I now want to focus on what are the major factors affecting the percentage fetal calf loss between confirmed pregnancy and weaning. And again, country type was shown to have an important effect. So percentage fetal calf loss in the central forest Northern Downs and Northern Forests were respectively 4%, 2% and 7% higher than in 
the southern forest. All right? So in particular, there was a big difference in fetal calf loss between the southern forest and the northern forest. And that probably almost, almost certainly represents that the northern forest is a much tougher, more hostile environment. Um, reproductive history of the cow. Percentage loss in cows which lactated the previous year was 4% lower than in those that did not lactate. In other words, um, uh, there is some evidence to suggest that <clears throat> um, uh, cows which did not lactate the previous year, for whatever reason, um, provide some indication that they uh, are at greater risk of uh, fetal calf loss than those that do lactate each year. Lactation number, when all other factors were taken into account, uh, fetal calf loss was higher in heifers than in mature cows, um, of the order of two percentage points higher. Mustering efficiency, um, and this is just simply a measure of how effectively we are able to muster cattle. Um, we found that uh, where mustering efficiency was less than 90%, uh, fetal calf loss was 9 percentage points higher. Now what that exactly means, um, it could be a, a proxy for the uh, how difficult the country is to muster. Um, it could be uh, a proxy for um, the, the, the mustering methods used. This is something that we have to investigate further, but that is what we found. Inadequate protein status during the dry season. So here we use the, the ratio of crude protein to dry matter digestibility, and it was the average for the May to October period. And where we found uh, the crude protein to dry matter digestibility was less than 0 0.125. Um, the fetal calf loss was four percentage points higher than where there was adequate protein status. And this uh, finding probably indicates that where um, there is a low protein status, a number of things are potentially going on. Firstly, the calf may be born with uh, lower birth weight, reduced calf vigour, and the cow may have lower milk production. All of those could contribute to a higher fetal calf loss. Now I want to have a look in a little more detail at a few uh, uh, further big factors affecting fetal calf loss. And one of the very interesting ones was um, whether uh, females, pregnant females, were mustered around the expected month of calving. And here we have um, heifers to first lactation females, second lactation mature breeders and age breeders. And where you can see the green line is not mustered around expected month of calving, the orange line is mustered around expected calving. And what we see is where heifers or <coughs> first lactation cows were mustered around the expected month of calving, that there was a nine percentage points higher um, fetal calf loss. Much less so for the cows. So this is telling us in particular that we need to avoid mustering these heifers, first lactation females, around the time of uh, calving. Pretty straightforward. How do we do it? Well, we can use fetal ageing. We can use fetal ageing to predict when the majority of females are going to be calving and hence adjust our mustering times to avoid um, uh, those periods. Heat stress. Um, the way in which we defined heat stress was through an equation which takes into account both the ambient temperature and the humidity. I think you all appreciate that as 
uh, humidity increases, uh, then uh, and if it's hot, then overall um, there is an increased risk of animals becoming uh, stressed due to heat stress. And so on the right hand side here, there is a, a, an indication of the severity of heat stress and the threshold value we used was 79 and so you can see this is where the 79 is sitting in here in what the um, authors of this um, uh, graph said was wooey. So pretty, pretty damn hot. And so the green line is a temperature humidity index above 79 during the expected month of calving, less than 15 days. Whereas the orange line it was a THI above 79 uh, for greater than or equal to 15 days. And this is by country type and so you can see where there was a high risk of heat stress during the month of calving in the southern forest, central forest and northern downs that there was a higher 4 to 7 percent higher fetal calf loss uh, than where there was a lower risk. The only place this didn't occur was in the northern forest and there could be a number of reasons as to why that is so. <clears throat> Possibly because um, it is generally very hot uh, throughout the entire period and so the ability to show a difference uh, was much less. But what it is indicating is that um, uh, the critical importance of mothering ability, distance to water, paddock shade, um, with, regret, with, with respect how we might reduce the impact of heat stress. Wet season, uh, fecal P to ME status and body condition score at the preg test muster. There was an interaction. So in particular where the risk of wet season uh, P deficiency adversely affecting performance was high and cows were in poor body condition, calf loss was 8 percentage points higher. We also looked, um, so I've, the, the factors I've presented to now are the big factors affecting fetal calf loss and percent pregnant within four months. We investigated because we knew producers were interested in these other factors. We investigated a number of other factors and I just want to share highlights of some of those. Um, effective genotype. So percent pregnant within four months of calving um, for animals that we estimated as having greater or equal to 50% Bos indicus was 13 to 15% lower than females that we considered to have less than 50% Bos indicus content. That's quite consistent with what we saw from the beef CRC and other studies. We measured uh, um, hip height and what we found is that uh, percent pregnant within four months of calving for shorter cows, that is less than 125 centimetres at the hip was 5% uh, higher than in taller cows and fetal calf loss was 4% lower in shorter cows compared to taller cows. Now, <clears throat> it's important here to emphasise that we're talking about a, uh, a phenotypic trait, not a uh, genetic trait, and it could well be that these cows are shorter because they reach puberty earlier um, and have had a calf each year, and hence their growth has been a little stunted, and, and what it is is a proxy for more fertile females. We looked at the, or attempted to look at the issue of the impact of wild dogs and we asked one question. We asked producers whether they considered that wild dogs were adversely affecting performance on their properties. So there were three categories um, and this here is the predicted fetal calf loss from the model uh, taking into account all the other major factors that I've spoken to you about with regards to percent fetal calf loss. And where wild dogs were not considered a problem, fetal calf loss was much lower than where fetal calf 
than the foetal calf loss where wild dogs were considered a problem. All right, and nearly half. But what was important, uh, we thought, was um, you might have expected that where baiting was used, that foetal calf loss might be intermediate. Um, but in fact, we found quite the reverse. Where, fetal, where, where baiting was routinely used because wild dogs were considered a problem, in fact, we saw the greatest um, fetal calf loss. And where uh, only shooting and trapping was utilised, uh, fetal calf loss was in fact lower. This is quite consistent with the, the findings uh, from uh, Lee Allen and others who have been investigating this issue over many years. And it does suggest with regards beef cattle um, breeding that we may have to relook at our approach to controlling wild dogs. Looking at the impact of infectious diseases, um, pestivirus, uh, where there was widespread evidence of infection around the time of mating, um, percent pregnant within four months of calving was 23 percentage points uh, lower than where there was uh, no evidence of infection. And in mobs where there was a high level of recent infection, um, uh, fetal calf loss was 8 percentage points higher. Where there was widespread evidence of venereal disease, fetal calf loss was 7 percentage points higher. Typically, we would find, we, in the past, we found that it would have been an impact on pregnancy rate, but in this study, we found an impact on fetal calf loss. Leptospirosis, uh, this was a very interesting finding. We only found a low level of infection uh, across the study. And yes, they were wetter in many cases than average years. So you might have expected a greater prevalence of leptospirosis. And that was not what we found. We did find that where there was um, uh, a high level of recent Leptospira pomona infection, which is the pig associated leptospire, there was a trend, not significant, for higher fetal calf loss. We found widespread evidence of three day bovine ephemeral fever, quite consistent with them being wetter years, but found no impact on the likelihood of cows becoming pregnant. And again, very interestingly, we found widespread evidence of the dog associated protozoan, Neospora caninum, that found no significant impact on fetal calf loss. So to, to summarise um, the approach that we have developed from the Cash Cow Project, um, this is the approach that we recommend. And it's all centred around producers asking the right questions. The first question is, how is my beef breeding business going? We can use the brick to generate KPIs. Then the next question would be, how much beef is being produced by each of my breeding herds. We can measure annual live weight production or weaner production from each herd using the cash cow methodology. The next question is, are the annual kilograms of beef produced from each breeding herd lower than expected or below what is commercially achievable? We can compare to the cash cow production benchmarks that now have been published. How am I breeding herds performing? Well, the first thing, quite obviously, we need to measure performance. And we've come up with a set of measures that we think provide the most useful indication of how, um, how a herd is performing with regards to reproductive performance. Then the question is, is the reproductive performance of, our, of my breeding herd lower than expected or below what is commercially achievable? Cash cow has generated benchmarks for reproductive performance. And then finally, what is likely to be contributing to any lower than expected or below what is commercially achievable performance? The critical thing is you need to be aware of what are the major factors. You need to look at those first. And the Cash Cow Project has now come up with a short list of what are the major factors affecting performance. Greg, I'm finished. And these two photos, um, I hope, show uh, the attendees, 
the enormous variation in environmental conditions that we experienced during the cash cow project. We had floods and we had drought. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Over to you, Wonderful. Guys. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we'll just wrap up quickly. I realise, uh, everyone, we're, we have gone over time and I do apologise, but we will wrap up with a few quick questions. Uh, and fortunately, we're not going to be able to get through them all. So uh, a couple of quick questions, Mike. For the northern forest area with an average of only 70% back in calf within four months after calving, and a commercially achievable value of 31%, have you done any work on the viabilities of these enterprises if their breeders are not having a calf every year? Um, there is a project uh, that is being conducted now, funded by MLA and led by Fred Chudley, looking at the economics using uh, the cash cow benchmarks and these and, and, and other data to look at the uh, the return on investment of improving performance. Um, at the end of the day, uh, the the important thing is um, that we don't use reproductive performance to judge whether a business is viable or not. The first thing you have to do is uh, estimate. Um, key performance indicators such as operating margin. That will tell you how the business is performing and then what we rec recommend is a diagnostic approach whereby you can investigate firstly um, uh, the impact of beef production, your current level of beef production and then um, the impact of reproductive performance. Okay, uh, one quick last question. Uh, did you identify different breeds that were better than others? No, we 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 did not. What the uh, initially we 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 thought we could record breed, but what we found is. Um, as, as many producers would recognise, it can be difficult to be accurate about the breed composition of cows coming through. And so rather than that, we asked producers um, uh, in conjunction with their veterinarians at the time to estimate the percentage boss indicators. So we've actually grouped cattle according to estimated boss indicus content into those less than 50%, 50 to 75% and greater than 75%. Okay, wonderful. I am very conscious of time, uh, everyone. So um, unfortunately, we'll have to continue on and just do a quick wrap up, but I will make sure that all the questions that weren't answered today are forwarded on to Mike and we can have them posted up um, in due course. So if we can just continue on and just do a quick wrap up, obviously these Beef Connect webinars are a partnership between Beef Central and Future Beef and it would be remiss of me not to mention the great daily emails that Beef Central crew send out daily. If you haven't signed up yet, then pop on over to beefcentral.com and do so. Also don't forget to visit the Future Beef website, your one stop shop for, for beef information across Northern Australia and in due course you'll find the webinar recording there. Uh, as I said to everyone who earlier, everyone who's registered with the email will get the link for that. Um, today's presentation, oh, sorry, beg your pardon. Um, try again. Uh, of course, we'll be asking for your feedback on today's event and we use SurveyMonkey for all the follow-up surveys and the monkeys will be waiting for your responses. So folks, that's all for today. Uh, again, I'd like to thank Michael for sharing his knowledge and his insights with us in relation to the Cash Cow Project and a big thank you to everyone for coming along and attending and interacting with us. It's been a real pleasure having you with us today. So until we connect again, it's all the best and hooroo for now. <laughs>